Melissa Tears is the founder of the Center for Integrative Hypnosis in New York City, a place near and dear to my heart. She is an award-winning hypnotherapist and author and has a uniquely down-to-earth approach to both. I'm sure you're going to love her as much as everyone else does on today's Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. All right, Melissa Tier, so good to have you on the program. Well, fun to talk to you, Doug. I I I got used to talking to you a lot. I know. It's weird. <laughs> it's just really weird that we haven't seen each other in months. I know. And we used know. to see each other like every well, every few days at least, you know, because yep. we were out of the same office in Manhattan. I know your office, the Center for Integrative Hypnosis that I was well, and yours. Part of. You know, yeah. I was just uh, talking about it last night at my supervision practice night. You know how I closed the center because someone said, "Oh, I recognize that piece of art from the center," and I said, "Yeah, I've got all my stuff around me," and I started pulling out from my drawer, you know, my snakes. <laughs> and syringes and uh, syringes. spiders and cockroaches and all of the things that any good coach should have in their drawer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> between that and I, I have, essential coaching props. I that's think. right. Yeah. And I have this little, you know, um, the t- world's tiniest violin that I like to show. Oh, very nice. Um, I work that into a fun pattern interrupt. Yeah. This is when the a client is whining. And it's playing just for you. <laughs> That's right. And so, you know, I, I started talking about that and someone had said that they 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 love the center and I was like, What class did you take there? Because I thought you were on the ver- the online class. And he said, I was there with Doug doing the the Havening class. Oh. And I had just right before that been talking about you teaching Havening because one of my students asked about it. Mm -hmm. Said, hey, you know, someone had mentioned Havening. What do you know about it? And I said, well, I'm not the expert, but but I'm friends with the expert. (laughs) And here's a little bit of what intrigued me about it, but definitely look up Doug O'Brien. So anyway. Nice. Very cool. Gave you a shout out, but it also, you know, he said that even though I wasn't there during that class at the center, he said, you know, you walk in, it's you all over. (laughs) <laughs> he said, I think there was a detonator there. I'm like, yes, <laughs> my, <laughs> my dynamite plunge. The one thing that I have taken from apartment to apartment since I was 22. Oh, wow. I've had that. So it's it's like now here. Years. It's yeah. made it to the Bronx. <laughs> you never know when you'll need a dynamite detonator. You know, it's funny. I used to have it um, before the center. I had my office on... Um, Fifth Avenue, which I think you came to visit. I did. Uh, visit there, you yeah. did a little uh, talk for some of my students many, yeah. many years ago. Long time ago. I forgot about that. Um, and I used to use it, you know, when people are like, I'm so angry, I don't know what to do. I would point to the detonator <laughs> and I'd say, blow something up. <laughs> and they would think in their mind and they would, pull it, because it takes a lot of effort. To it pull does. No, that's I was impressed. By and it. of course they would start laughing because everyone feels like Wiley Coyote. <laughs> so it's a great pattern interrupt. It's that's kind true. of symbolic, metaphoric. And, and ultimately there's not a single person that pressed it down that didn't laugh. Yeah. And to me, that's laughter true. is, is the way out. Yeah. So those of you who don't know exactly what we're talking about, that Melissa had this, I don't know from, 1850 this <laughs> wooden box with a big metal plunger in it it was a it was a gear drifting thing so i mean it took energy took power energy yeah. physical strength if you don't know what we're that. talking about just watch any road runner it's the acme plunger where he plunges it down and and something blows up it's, it's a dynamite him, actually yeah <laughs> I don't know what it's called, actually. <laughs> I just know it's called the detonator, but I don't think that's what it is. But 
Awesome stuff. And and just so people know um, what we're talking about, Melissa had a center in New York City on West 29th Street for many years called the Center for Integrative Hypnosis. And a couple of years ago, she invited me to um, move in. It was like, oh, my God, really? So I, I, I became part of the center there. And, and I had an office that was very important to me. And, and uh, I loved it, loved being there. And I spent a lot of time and effort to make it the way I wanted to be, you know, put a rug down, that soundproofed it. I got the stand up desk and shit. Yeah. And I was all ready to do basically I was all ready to start doing what I'm doing, except from there. And then COVID and hit. Plague. And I'm doing everything that I was doing in this, you know, fancy schmancy office thing on my laptop on my kitchen table. <laughs> so. Right. Right. It's it's although it's got it's definitely got a different vibe. One of the things that we've all come to realize, right, is, is how portable our skills are. And Mm -hmm. that's really important. Um, I, I knew that, uh, when I went to Mexico for the winter, um, but I didn't know the extent of it. Like I never, back then I knew I was doing one-on-one sessions, but if you would have said, can you do your certification training, you know, from Mexico over the computer, I'd be like, no, we need hands-on, it's drills, it's practice, it's right. practice, it's hands-on. But, you know, we adapt. And I'll tell you that I've taught, you know, four or five different, you know, intensives, uh, whether it's my coaching the unconscious mind intensive or my integrative hypnosis intensive via Zoom, mm-hmm. uh, something I, before the plague, never would have thought I would ever do. Yeah. because I'm such a hands-on kind of person. Um, and I'll tell you that with the breakout rooms and the ability to sit in on the breakout rooms, observe, correct, assess, give feedback, um, people get it. And the most ama- for me, the way that I really see is I host biweekly supervision practice nights for anyone who's taken my training. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing that for... God, like 17 years or something, 16, 17 years, because I'm always teaching the class I wish I had had when I started. Mm-hmm. So before every Gosh, that you know, such class, a I do that exact same thing. You're absolutely right. That's, that's what right. I, it's like, yeah. what do I wish I knew from the beginning? What do I wish I had access to? Yeah. So for me, it was a community. I wanted to be able to say, oh my God, you know, I have this client and I did this, but I'm really stumped. Where do I go next? What would you do? And so the first, <laughs> the, the first hour of uh, my supervision practice is all that Q and A. And so people join in and, you know, I train, uh, mostly I train therapists and psychiatrists and people like that have a practice that is not necessarily just a coaching practice or a hypnosis practice. So I get a variety of topics going on that, um, that keep me learning as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so the, for the first hour is really that it's Q and a, it's what would you do? What, and you know, it's, what are you reading? What's good? What, what are you learning? You know, what, what are you learning in the past two weeks? Yeah. And you know, and then the next hour of that is, you know, I put everyone in breakout rooms and whether I give them an assignment of something I'm developing or playing with, because that's the rule, right? I never mm-hmm. charge extra for the supervision um, practice nights and it is every other Wednesday. But the rule is, if I say close your eyes, everybody closes their eyes. That's the rule. Uh, you know, you, I get uh, ongoing guinea pigs we call that, and they get uh, supervision. Yeah, and we, that's what we call Brooklyn hypnosis, you know. <laughs> so close your eyes, you know. We got ways of making you close your eyes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> one thing that I do in a big, big room, like when I'm teaching at, at conferences and there's like, you know, 100 people in the room or whatever, and everyone's buzzed because I just gave them something to practice. I think I, I, think I took it from John Overdurf. You just get up there, you know, with the microphone. And instead of saying, come on, everyone, shh, you know, quiet down, you know, get back into your seats. Instead of being that lady, mm-hmm. all I have to say is, all right, everybody, close your eyes. And man, it's like, it, that's like a bell 
to, yeah. you know, to, to the hypnotist, everyone just stops in the middle of a sentence and closes their eyes. And then I say, <laughs> you can open them now. So how was that? <laughs> and it's just, it's just nicer than saying, That's can everyone funny. shut the hell up? Yes, you know? yes. Cause you would never use language like that. No, me? Come no, on. No, I, I know. I would. I, of course. So, not. so one of the things that, um, that I noticed after teaching these certification courses online was number one, how you quickly forget the screen. Yeah, no, it's true. And you're just connecting to the people and the students and you're doing your thing and you're sharing and you're all laughing and we're having fun. Yeah. But more importantly, a month, two months later during supervision or practice nights, the feedback, because you know, you, you, you could be practicing with someone that took my training 16 years ago or someone that took my training last week. And so I mix it up. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I get the feedback. Yeah. And all of the people that learned the skill set online, that's their medium. Right. So they're doing great because they're, this is how they learned how to do it. Whereas some of my older clients, Um, you know, we're like a little slow and nervous to move into the virtual space. So I think that there are some perks to it as well. As you know, my last class, I had someone from Pakistan, someone, you know, know, when we started teaching havening classes, you know, havening is a psychosensory therapy. So in other words, there is touch involved. And Mm -hmm. I remember when I first talked to you about it, it's like, you touch them. That's the way it works. You kind of... (laughs) Really? Yeah, I gave you, you I gave you a little people. pushback on that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so, but it was t- yeah. The, the practitioner does the havening touch on the client for the most part. There are exceptions, of course, if they don't want to be touched, then they can do it themselves. But for the most part, it was like a, a, like a massage kind of thing situation. And then, of course, we started doing um, the practice groups in your office. I led them, and and there would be people say, "Can can we watch this? I can't make it into the city, so." Can I be part of it? So we started Zooming as yeah. part of the practice groups. It was just an additional thing. And then when COVID hit, it was amazing. We had a, a planned practice group. And um, Stephen Rudin, who's one of the two doctors who created Havening, was going to be the presenter that night in your office there in Manhattan, our office. Um, and so we said, no, we're not going to do it live. We'll do yeah. it virtually and um, open it up to like, Anybody who wants to come. There were over 100 people from all over the world on this thing. And so, that's, so it's been amazing because it's just been continuing yeah, there, to grow. We've definitely had classes. trade-offs. Yeah. Columbia. And I think the biggest, the biggest perk is that people can join in that couldn't. You know, New York is kind of expensive. People would, you know, um, I had my, my uh, eight-day intensive scheduled for June. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was literally not canceling it for months thinking, come on, it, it's five months away. It's four months away. It's It'll three months away. What, what? <laughs> and then it got to the point where I was like, all right, all right, we're just going to, I'm going to call this. And I had about, I think I had like 18 people that mm-hmm. were supposed to fly into New York and stay for eight days. That's an expensive, That's expensive. proposition. No doubt. So I wanted to, I checked the airlines and I, I knew that there was a window and I wanted to everyone to be able to get their money back, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I kind of put, put it out there. I said, look, I can cancel this and you can, you know, uh, refund you or put it towards, you know, when the world calms down or I can do this online. General consensus was do it online. And not only did all those 18 people uh, were up for it, but like eight more people joined yeah. it, you yeah. know? And, and so it, it was, it was good. First time and I caught a sleight of mouth class online. I thought I'd, I'd get 30, 40 people. I got 140 people. See? Yeah. So, yeah. So let's just take a moment and smile because, yes. you know, it's we're, like, we're building it's like other, other ways of being together and, and having a community. One thing I've, I've decided um, when I, when I closed the center is um, <clears throat> we talked about this. I have a new Kajabi site for my online mm-hmm. uh, courses, mm-hmm. you know, just the streaming uh, yeah. videos. Mm-hmm. Well, now I'm going to do uh, what I'm calling the student hub. 
and it's it's going to be a, a nominal fee, like a member, a small membership price, mm-hmm. just to keep the thing running. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to have uh, not just you know posting my practice the first hour of practice nights because so many people from different time zones can't always make it. Right. So I'm going to post that, but I have other things I'm posting like, you know, trance of the week and fun things, but I'm, I'm going to hook it to another site inside of it. That's going to be like this, like an open room Mm -hmm. where you can kind of go and see if anyone's hanging out, you know, and then practice for those people that can't make practice nights or just have conversations. There's going to be a, you know, what are you reading? And, you know, book lists, there's going to be favorite, you know, resources and TED Talks. But mainly it's, it's I want to build the community nice. that I had at the center. Yeah. I want to be able to just, anyone can, you know, kind of like Facebook where you could just log on anytime and see what's going on, see who's there, see what's been posted, except it's not Facebook. So, yeah. you know, I've been trying to wean myself off of, Facebook and any other social media for the most part, because it's just to, you know, a little too dastardly um, as far as getting me to buy shit. (laughs) Because I fall for it, man. (laughs) I'm like, the universe somehow knows that I was looking at that. Yeah. And thinking about buying it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Anyway. The universe might not know, but they're not sending you their ads. Right. So I'm, so I'm kind of, um, I'm excited about that, that kind of ad free space and, 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 you know, creating a student hub where I'll be having like guests come in. Yeah. You know, like you can come in and share, you know, whatever you wanted to share for the, the week or whatever. Oh, yeah. And so Sounds that's, fantastic. I'm kind of excited about that. Kajabi is a nice space. I've got my essential coaching skills uh, space there. Well, speaking of essential coaching skills, um, we're talking about essential Oh, yeah. It's a podcast. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we're just talking. But okay, right. You, yeah. you, you so might have questions. Let me ask you a question. Now, I, I know. I've known you for a long, long, long time. I also know that you've written a bunch of books like the um, Integrative Hypnosis mm-hmm. book, the Anti-Anxiety Toolkit. Um, but I'm very curious about your coaching. And you've got, you teach a thing, and I think you've written a book. Is I don't know if that's true or not, but called Coaching the Unconscious. Is that is that a book um, or is that just something you do? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's one of those books that's always being written in my head, okay. um, always being revised and updated. So... Uh, you do teach a course on that called Co- I do. So coaching. coaching the unconscious mind, I've been teaching that as a course for many, many years. And I have um, the, the videos of that available. Talk to me um, about that. What, book, is, what though, does that mean, coaching the unconscious? The book is not, you know, it's one of those ongoing things. You know, I have a, a few books that I am always not writing. Yeah, I gotcha. But talk to me, <laughs> how, do you coach, how does one coach the unconscious mind? What does that mean? Well, you know, um, it's, it's mainly being more aware, right? Being more aware of how the nervous system functions, being more aware of your unconscious influence and what your clients are giving you unconsciously. So it's, it's not just the very standard coaching of, you know, the cognitive, you know, um, behavioral model or even the, you know, the stuff that's real kind of, conscious minded prefrontal cortex, you know, logical, rational, let's make a plan. Let's do the action steps. Let's have this coaching contract. It's really about going deeper. So it's taking all of the, you know, these more subtle forms of communication, bringing in hypnotic communication, being aware of what your words are doing, being aware on of, of how, Uh, to move minds, whether it's utilizing spatial, temporal language, you know, embedded suggestions. I don't call them embedded commands. Mm -hmm. I prefer suggestions. (laughs) But anyway, um, but also being aware of, you know, the millions of bits of information that we're transmitting between us and how to start to influence that. So with an understanding of polyvagal theory, and how the nervous system is, you know, checking for safety every moment, how we can start to modify our tempo, tonality, so that we're soothing the nervous system, 
how we can start to prime the unconscious mind. So, you know, we're talking about the center. um, And of course, you probably pick up on it. But so many things in that center were strategic. Mm. I know how to prime the unconscious mind. It was very obvious to you, but to your average client, they don't understand why there's certain lighting, why there's certain colors on the walls, why there's images of green trees, forests. We know that they boost interleukins. You know, why my uh, coaching chair is soft and cozy because by sitting on a softer seat, embodied cognition tells us that their mind is more malleable. They're more open to change. Whether it's putting, you know, some form, intake form on a heavier clipboard that lends weight to the session. So understanding embodied cognition, understanding how the environment, um, and now it's kind of interesting, right? What are we priming now on our screens? Like we have to kind of give a little more thought to that um, because it's, you know, it's a new environment. So Coaching the unconscious mind brings in all of these things so that we are coaching on many levels. It's a multi-level communication model. Okay. And um, as well as your practical neuroscience. You know, I am always aware, you know, the first level of work that I do with clients is um, what I call the self-direct, self-directed neuroplasticity frame, the level, which is arm clients with a a, a bunch of rapid techniques, pattern interrupts so that they're empowered. They know they can stop a craving. They know they can stop anxiety. But more importantly, the bigger picture is that they know that each time they interrupt that pattern behavior, they're starting to create new neural connections. Mm -hmm. So, you know, coaching the unconscious mind really does keep the brain in mind. You know, it really does kind of work on how we can utilize the different forms of neuroplasticity, you know, and uh, therapeutic memory reconsolidation. How can we instigate um, the brain to unlock a memory and then throw in uh, the, the required kind of prediction error that creates that protein synthesis, which changes the emotional track? of the brain. So, so to me, that's, that's kind of um, the stuff of coaching the unconscious mind. It, it incorporates all the different ways we are communicating that's outside of our conscious awareness. It takes into consideration unconscious biases and heuristics and the brain as a, a budgeter of resources, which is really what it was evolved to do. You know, it, it was evolved to better control the expenditure of, you know, uh, energy and resources. And so once you kind of start to, you know, share that stuff with clients and you say, look, this is, you know, this is your nervous system. This is what it's doing. You couldn't stop it if you tried. You know, when you went into that freeze response or the shutdown response, that's your vagus nerve. You can't, you you didn't have any choice. That was what the brain dictated in that moment was the best possible way to survive. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. give yourself some credit instead of beating yourself up that you didn't do more or fight back or do whatever. Understand how your nervous system runs. And then how do we influence it? Because that's the other piece, right? Not just understanding, but You know, way back when I used to uh, be more of a research junkie, you know, I would just read anything and everything to try and understand what the hell was going on under the hood. You know, when I was learning how to do all this stuff, but I, I felt like I didn't understand it. People would say, what is hypnosis? And I would say, you know, I've been doing it for 18 years. I still don't fucking know, you know, like what really is going on? Um, And one of my rules for myself to, to make spending so much time, energy, and money on learning all this was to make it practical. So it's one thing to understand polyvagal theory and, 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 and neuroception, you know, the, the perception of your nervous system. That is such a great word that Stephen Porges uh, created. Um, but how do I use it? Right? 
How do I make sure that I'm utilizing the key ingredients to make my clients feel heard and safe? Right. Very cool. How do I use my tone of voice and, and, and the fluctuation and the prosody and my facial expressions to calm the nervous system? Nice. So that too is, 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 is kind of. Can I ask you, when you think of coaching, um, that word coaching was invented, I think, or it wasn't invented, but it was, it became part of psychotherapy instead of um, psychotherapy, probably in the nineties or so. The first time I ever heard it, I'd learned it from a guy named Thomas Leonard, but um, you know, it's, it's, everyone is doing coaching now. Everyone is a coach. Everyone does coaching. Do you think of uh, just a hypnosis session as coaching or is it, do you have a different, is, is therapy, hypnotherapy, is, is that different from coaching? I think it depends on the hypnotist. So I think an old school hypnotist that, you know, the, the client's going to come in, you're going to gather a little bit of information, you're going to put them into a trance, and then you're going to make all these suggestions right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and the person is just having this passive experience. I don't think that's coaching. I think my form of, uh, you know, of a hypnosis um, session is far more dynamic and, and in, integrative. And so I am pulling the talents. I am pulling the resources. I am pulling these inner strategies and anchors and information from the client, See, to me, I think coaching, I think of sports and I think, what do they really do? I mean, obviously they, they can provide them with the information to play that game, to do that thing, to, to do that. But really they're trying to evoke the talents from the client, from Mm -hmm. who they're coaching. So I think of it kind of like that. I have a lot of information. My clients usually don't. I can show them how this strategy they're running is mediated in different ways or how, you know, uh, how their, their thought processes run. I can say, look, you're making this image or you're, you're having, you're running this dialogue and here's how we manipulate that. So I'm taking their images and their dialogue, but I'm teaching them a skill set they didn't have. Right. Right. right? So for me, coaching is a dynamic co-creative model of change. Nice. It's not, you're going to come into my office and I'm going to, you know, think I know best and I'm going to just make all these suggestions. You know, I don't, I'm not a fan of that type, that style of hypnosis. I, one of the things that I always say is to me that that's very much like uh, someone standing outside of trance, outside of the field mm-hmm. and making commands from the outside in to a, to a client. Whereas Mm. my form of hypnosis is a little more Ericksonian in that I go in first and it's an invitation, not a command. You Mm. know what I mean? And, and, and I'm evoking, it has to be organic. It has to come from the client. Beautiful. And so sometimes like, you know, uh, like what they said of, um, you know, uh, chipping away at the marble to find the David within. <laughs> you know, sometimes we got to chip away some stuff. We got to clear some stuff. We got to knock down some stuff. But really what we're hoping to do is find that, that you know, that masterpiece. Right. That's already there. Just have to so to me, that's, the, that's kind of the difference, you know, is one is yeah, like an external agent. So let me just ask you this. If you were putting yourself in the, in the shoes of somebody who's maybe listening to this podcast because they're curious about coaching, want to be a coach, uh, want to enter into the field, think, boy, I, I want to quit my, my job in the uh, stock market or whatever and, and do something meaningful with my life, become, become a coach. Um, what would be like an essential skill that they need to have in order to be a good coach? <clears throat> an essential skill. I mean, to me, the most important, I don't know if I would call it a skill, but the the first order, the main thing you need, I think, is curiosity. Hmm. You've got to really be curious. Curious about the person in front of you. Curious about the nature of change. 
curious about, you know, every aspect of the interaction. Not only if you're curious is the, um, the nonverbal communication and the space between you two, uh, you know, rich, rich with resonance and rich with dopamine, you know, your brains, your hearts, everything's syncing up when you're curious, they lean in too. And I think if you can evoke curiosity from your clients, then, you know, half, half the job is done. Mm. So for me, I think that I always kind of joke that curiosity is like my superpower, mm. you know, because that's what keeps me in this field. That's cool. You and I will never be having a conversation, you know, 30 years from now even, where we'll be like, yep, we know all there is to know about <laughs> hypnosis. Or, we've reached the, we've reached we've, the cap. We know everything we, about the mind yeah. or change or the brain. The brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so curiosity keeps me in the field. Curiosity you know, keeps me interesting. present. I was, I was reading that um, Albert Einstein once was asked, you know, how is it that he's so smart? And he said, I don't think I'm any smarter than anybody else. I'm just a lot more curious. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because I always say curiosity is one of those things where, you know, if you can get a client curious, where there's curiosity, there typically isn't fear and anxiety. Mm. There mm. isn't, you know, it, it mm. kind of doesn't allow for that. It feels not only like the most amazing hub state where you can kind of go anywhere from there, yeah. but I feel like by being there, it... Uh, excludes anxiety yeah. and fear. Yeah. And then I always think of my father and I always joke because my father used to always use the word curious. He would say something like, I'm curious. What made you think you can come strolling in at two in the morning? You know, and it's like, he wasn't curious. <laughs> <laughs> That's not curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> because real curiosity, yeah. right? Think about it. What is curiosity? We lean forward. We yeah, move true. towards. Anyway. Yeah. And so you're right. It's a be... great hub state. It's a great thing. When in, yeah. in NLP, we often use that. You know, it's like, let's move from whatever it is we are into curiosity, because from there, you can move any direction. You That's want. right. Like confusion, right? So, but as far as a skill set goes, I would say the most vital skill set I think for anyone going into the coaching field would be a knowledge of um, the meta pattern that my friend John Overdurf uh, pointed out, but it is the pattern underneath almost every NLP pattern, which is why, you know, having a skill set that has a foundation in neurolinguistic programming is going to give you the meta pattern in many forms. Right. But to me, it's understanding what's underneath that. And then you don't need any of the uh, patterned uh, techniques because right. you have the basic understanding of how the brain changes. So and please, please, me, please tell us what that is. <laughs> so I should say you're already using it. If All you're right. a change worker and you do good work. In other words, if you help someone to make a change and it lasts, I can pretty much point out the meta pattern underneath. It's the yeah. four step process of change that really was taught to me and, and many others really comes from the work of John Overdurf, where he looked at all of these NLP patterns and he was looking for the structure underneath. Mm -hmm. And so um, we could go through havening and EFT and traditional hypnosis and timeline, re-imprinting, regression to cause, you know, all of these techniques, the backwards spin, any of them. And I can show you how they follow the same pattern. Funny enough, it's also the pattern that uh, you have to follow in order to get therapeutic memory reconsolidation to happen. It's also the four steps of Jeffrey Schwartz's work. Um, for you know his OCD patients, the Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz, and so you start to see the met like my students when we when they go to conferences, mm -hmm. like part of what they're they're doing when they go and sit in on lectures is they're tracking the pattern, they're seeing how this 
conforms or is there a step missing and what could they add to it to make that, mm-hmm. that more useful? So okay. it's four steps. And the first step is, you know, associate into, into the problem state. And basically what you need is you need to light up the kind of neural network of that problem state. The, some would say get into the energy of the state, light up the neural network, but really you're looking for information. You're looking for where they get triggered. And in that moment that they get triggered, what's turning it on? What starts the unconscious habituated pattern, right? What presses the button? So step one is associate into the problem state. Step two, a vital step (laughs) is dissociate from the problem. Now, while you can dissociate uh, cognitively consciously, right? To, you know, how do you want to feel instead? Or you could do a technique, you could do havening, you can tap, you could do anything that gets you from that highly activated emotional state. But please understand the neural network of the problem stays kind of lit up. Like Mm -hmm. the, the memory reconsolidation window, they say, stays open for quite a few hours. So knowing that the brain is still lit up, but emotionally you can dissociate Because step three is you need to associate into the resources, how you want to feel instead. Start to bring in a positive emotional state because step four is you need to attach that positive emotional state to the trigger. And that is the four steps of the meta pattern. And when I first heard this, John was teaching it uh, with his coaching model, which is he does this conversationally, right? That's what Mm -hmm. I'm trained in. That's what I've been doing for, I don't know, 14 years Mm -hmm. and training people in. Um, Because although it's underneath all these techniques, you want to be able to do it, especially if you're a coach, conversationally, where it doesn't necessarily look like a technique. It just looks like a conversation, albeit one that gets repetitive. (laughs) <laughs> because you got to condition it in, right? We still, heavy in law, the neurons that fire together, wire together is still at play. So you have to condition it in. You know, you don't just think one iteration is going to do it. So it's, you know, associate into the problem, dissociate to gather resources and then associate, embody the resource state and then relook at the trigger. And that is the elements, Right. Now, with therapeutic memory reconsolidation, one of the key components is you need to install, you know, you need to have like a mismatch, a prediction error, because it's the prediction error where your brain, which is a prediction organ, that is how it functions. Seriously, 99% of the time, your brain is just following its predictions. Right? Seriously, when you start to look at it, we are so... Unconscious. Well, tell us, what you mean by that. <laughs> tell us what you mean by that. It's, it's following its yeah. predictions. What do you mean? So, well, first, um, you know, your, your brain, it's, it, 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 it operates programs, right? It uses, I, I mentioned earlier how, how we budget resources. Well, the brain uses 20% of our energy, right? That's a lot. Mm. Uh, and so it's always looking to conserve energy. Welcome to automaticity, right? Anything Correct. done with repetition becomes automated because then it, 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 it takes a lot less energy to fire mm-hmm. that yeah. program, yeah. right? So what happens is it's always functioning by prediction, right? So it's predicting your next move or what even what you see, what you hear, because it's, it's predicting that. It saves energy. Now, with memory reconsolidation, the key is if your brain is predicting that every time you go into an elevator, you're going to have a panic attack because mm-hmm. you've had a panic attack in the past and a panic attack, you know, gets the brain's attention. High anxiety gets the brain's attention. It pays attention because it's trying to keep you alive. That's the brain's job that, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. budget resources to mainly keep you alive and, you know, uh, propagating. <laughs> so, um, so, If you do a little technique, I don't, you know, whatever technique you want, whatever piece of change work you want. And then when they imagine getting into that uh, elevator and there's no anxiety, that too gets the brain's attention. 
because something has changed. Its prediction was thrown off. It predicts anxiety and all of a sudden there isn't any. And in that moment is when the brain undergoes this very interesting thing. It's like this, um, this protein synthesis and God help me, I forget the, the names, but something happens in the brain because it needs to update the information. And, you know, the way I always describe this when I'm teaching uh, therapeutic memory reconsolidation, for anyone listening, if you Google that, you'll come up with a couple of great articles, like Bruce Ecker has uh, some good articles out there, and the neuro, the neuro psychologist newsletter that Richard Hill does and a couple of other people in Australia, they've got a bunch of good articles up as well for therapeutic memory reconsolidation, Great, which is different than just m- what memory normally does. It's always updating. It's always malleable, right? But it's yeah. usually subtle. It's so subtle that you would swear by your memory, right? We think we remember. <laughs> you know, somebody, a great uh, memory researcher said, the best way to preserve a memory is to never recall it. That's fascinating. Yeah, John, Because as soon uh, as you recall it, it becomes malleable. And, it becomes and then when it gets re-encoded, reconsolidated, re-consolidated. it gets reconsolidated with everything you know now. Right, right. John Grinder used to say that, um, probably still does, that every recall <laughs> is, a, is a reframe. Every time you yes, recall something, it changes. It, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, so a prediction error is I predict, and oh, I was going to say, you know, um, I always use the, the cave woman uh, thing, you know, if, 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 if she's, go- she's going to get the, the berries of the season, she always remembers where those berries are because mm-hmm. they're yummy. <laughs> I always joke back then they didn't have, you know, Snickers bars and, you know, berries. Bars. that was right. That was the sweetness. Right. And so you never forget that. And so when you go there one day and, and you're excited for these berries and instead you encounter a family of tigers that decides to live there now, in that moment, that prediction, I predict berries and instead I'm faced with something threatening Mm -hmm. or something different because different is really the key. Uh, Then immediately my brain has to update the information for our survival. Now that's an extreme example, but it shows you how we survived evolutionarily because in that moment, the brain says, nope, no longer are you going to remember this place as the place to continue to get berries? You need to remember this place to avoid it. Right, for sure. Now, we can utilize the mechanism underneath that for our coaching changes. Nice. And when you do it, things change. Now, I I had a supervision last night, and and on there was a a student who had uh, done a session with me a couple of weeks ago. And she just said, I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't understand how that session changed this entire thing. It's gone. I just don't, I don't have it. I don't have this thing anymore. What the hell? And I'm like, you know, cause she had only taken like a small workshop with me. She didn't take my whole training. <laughs> and so I was like, this is being tenacious with conditioning in that new utilizing the meta pattern basically. And, you know, and I'm trying to say, it's not me. She's like, you're magic. No, it's not me. It's just understanding the basic mechanism of how the brain changes and being tenacious enough and a lot less self-conscious to be repetitive, to keep hitting it. So I'll, I'll, you know, and now as you're feeling this feeling, now see that thing. What are you noticing now? A little bit. Well, that's right. A little better. And as you're feeling a little better, and what do you think about this? And let's add resources and see that thing and see that thing. Well, nowadays I've gotten better at utilizing the repetition and um, to embed more suggestions. So I'll say things like, now I'm going to keep repeating this so that we condition it in so that it's the change happens automatically. So I just use like my little descriptors yeah. as embedded suggestions for change and it builds expectation. And then they become more forgiving about me saying the same shit over and over and over and over again until they're like, I'm great. Really? 
<laughs> enough. <laughs> and my friend John would say, well, how do you know? Because yeah. it forces them to go inside and loop it again. You know, I never convince a client they've changed. They have to convince me. Nice. So anyway, so I think that is the essential skill. That's beautiful. Thank you. That's and great. for anyone listening, if you're not aware of John Overdurf's work, just go to johnoverdurf.com. He really is, in my opinion, one of the best minds in this field because he's, he's always innovating. Mm -hmm. You know, always. He's been in this game for a really long time. So to me, that would be curiosity and an understanding of, of some of the, 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 you know, the basics of change and, you know, a little neuroplast, a little understanding how the brain changes goes a long way. Indeed. No, it's fantastic. And I was really pleased how you said that almost every pattern fits to that because. Yeah, almost. There, yeah, it's, it's. There are because your brain immediately went to where it doesn't. I, I've been looking for that for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I first learned about that, I said, well, wait a minute, not everything holds it. So I would be searching for the different exceptions. But it's still true that almost everything. Almost, yeah. yeah, almost, not everything. Although, you know, it's funny because when I think, well, you know, like this doesn't fit, then I'm like, well, actually, does it? Because even like simple reframes and things like that, that puts you a different reframe would put you into a different emotional state. And then from that emotional lens, you'd be looking at the problem and there's the collapse, you know, like I can, so we, it's we, challenging. We, we I search mean, for time, pattern recognition, but I think that there are, you know, even time, you know, heals. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how does time heal? Because Except ultimately what you were saying before, because yeah. the uh, <laughs> memory reconsolidation stuff. Every time, yeah. every time there's a recall, there's a reframe. Right. So it, it changes over time. But yeah, we're just basically speeding up the process. And know. I think it's important to arm your clients to be resourceful. So, you know, for me, uh, a good coach should teach you how to be resilient and resourceful outside of the office. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm, I'm not doing therapy. I'm, I'm teaching. I'm training. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's, that's it. You know, I am a teacher and that's, yeah. I'm a teacher, whether I'm teaching a class or just one client, yeah. I'm teaching them how to access these states. I'm teaching them how to change their brain. I'm teaching them how to, you know, understand their own inner strategies and use their own templates in, yeah. in a more resourceful and creative way. Um, I think, a teacher would be the way I would describe myself more than a coach or a hypnotist. I use these things. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the other thing I've always been impressed by with you, Melissa, is that um, you do teach, you do inspire, you do create these spaces for people. And, and you've got kind of a, a, a fan club. I mean, there's a lot of people, I mean, the, the, um, <laughs> I mean, the Center for Integrative Hypnosis, just where I was part of it for a couple of years, there, everybody there was a student of yours at some point or another. Um, you, you've been a really fantastic um, champion of people becoming successful in what they're well, doing. So that was my original idea for the center, mm. right? So my original idea was to create a space <clears throat> where – New, new hypnotists, new coaches starting out would have a place to land. So um, I knew that I needed quite a few offices, right? So mm -hmm. that when you first started, if I would make uh, students commit to, they could, you know, people were like, oh, do you rent out office space by the hour? I'm like, no. Do I look like I want to be managing that crap? No. But <laughs> if you want Mondays, and I charged like almost like a ridiculously low fee initially mm -hmm. when I first opened it up. I think, what was it? 200 bucks to 250 for the month. And you can have all Mondays. You can book it from the morning till night. That's four days. You know, that's each Monday. Yeah. Yeah. And once they got to the point where they were, they needed another day. So then they would, you know, it's yeah. like I was able to foster their um, practice without a heavy duty a financial burden on them because I know what it's like to start. Oh, and I found a reasonably priced office that one on Fifth Avenue, 
the first one, you, you, you saw the second one, but the first one was, was pretty cheap for New York, for Fifth Avenue standards, mm-hmm. but it was mm-hmm. still a chunk of money before I had even figured out how to build a practice. Sure. And so, yeah, so at, at the center, most people were my students. You were the only one who came in who wasn't. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so, so there's that. But, you know, the fan club, it's funny. Uh, someone recently said something like when they were at Hypno Thoughts that just you were like this buzzword or blah, blah, blah. You know, why? What did you do? And I think, you know, it's just um, having fun. And maybe it's because I'm a woman. And traditionally in at the hypnosis conferences or whatever, mm-hmm. the big kind of trainers who would fill a big room were mostly men, mm-hmm. it seemed. Certainly at the NGH and things like that, you know, they were pretty... <laughs> Yeah. Male dominated. Sure. So I think that has added to, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a, a kind of strong uh, in your face yeah. woman um, sure. in the field because most women in the field at the time when I was certainly coming up, you know, yeah. were very maternal and nurturing and sure. soft spoken. And, you and- know, I could easily grapple with with the big boys, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe so that, let me just ask you this. Know. So f- from that perspective, uh, as being a, a person who encourages people starting out, what, what kind of advice would you have now for somebody who wants to start out as a coach or as a hip, hypno coach or however you, you know, um, you? well, the game has changed a little bit with, you know, with people starting out during this, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> sure. this quarantine time, Mostly but online stuff. Yeah. You know, for the most part, besides con- besides continuing to learn, don't think for a moment you got to, you know, that, that this is something that ever stops. Right. You know, like you will be reading something relevant to your change work for the rest of your life. You will yeah, be absolutely. watching video. You will, be, you know, yeah, yeah. that sign on for that. So there's the curiosity bit. That's the curiosity bit. Absolutely. And, and the-, the other, the other thing is where are you now? Right. A lot of times, one of the things I've helped cultivate um, in, in my, in my new students, um, the ones that don't already have a therapy practice, because there is a big faction of my students that came to me with a thriving practice and they're just integrating everything in. Okay. Okay. But for those starting off, I always say, where are you now? Do you belong to any groups? What are your hobbies? Oh, you go to this gym? Great. Oh, you, you, you go to Weight Watchers? You go to AA? You uh, work in corporate America where HR might have you come in and teach a stress uh, management workshop? You know, So utilize where you are. Like one of my students... Kristen Prevole, many years ago, she was a professor of English and a poet. She took my class and I, you know, and she was like, I don't know, I really want to do this full time. And I said, look, you know, first of all, my advice to newbies is always, if your job isn't an absolute soul sucking hellish place, then don't quit your job yet. Let's ease into this without stress. So start by booking, you know, uh, f- you know, evening clients or a Saturday, you know, clients and wait till you can consistently fill up, you know, a Saturday yeah, right. and an evening, and then you can ease into it. Cause nobody likes the smell of desperation yeah. on, you know, you <laughs> know, please good. let me help you because <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't like that, yeah. but where are you now and what's around you is key. So Kristen immediately created trance poetics. Oh, that's beautiful. And it was awesome. She would take people in deep trances and they would write from there. Oh, wow. And cool. they would go in for creativity. So yeah. then I had someone, Nicholas, who is an opera singer, right? And he is now, like they fly him to all these like opera, opera schools to work with their singers Mm -hmm. and he does workshops. So there's someone who is an actor. So, you know, they, they now they specialize in helping actors to really embody their roles. Beautiful. So for me, it's, you know, 
where, where are you and how can you pull from there? Because you <laughs> already have one foot in this circle. Right. How can you bring this skill set in? Nice. If you work for corporate America, you know, what do they need? Stress management is always an easy thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I train a lot of nurses, right? So I'm like, why don't you offer a free, you know, nur- nursing burnout session, you know? And of course, what happens is, you know, just like crack, hypnosis is very enticing. It kind of <laughs> sells itself. So give them a little taste and then they're going to want some... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my, <laughs> my past is showing. Um, but anyway, <laughs> you know, and they tend to, you tend to get clients there. If right. you're a member of Weight Watchers and you say, hey, uh, let uh, me show you these three craving busters, yeah, then people awesome. are going to want to work one on one with you. So that would be the first advice I would give. Well, that's obvious. That's actually second. The first advice was stay curious. You know, don't yeah. quit your day job so that you're not desperate and, and look around you, right? Cool. Because to me, my, you know, your education didn't start when you walked into my classroom or signed on to the Zoom call. Your education has been going on since you were born, you know? And so what have you learned that, that is a vital skill for here? Yeah, and also, of course, being you and how do you set yourself apart from other people yeah. having that unique selling proposition. So yeah. That's, and, uh, and I just recently said that, you know, someone said, well, I tried this, you know, uh, you know, one of my little pattern interrupts that I had shared that I did. They were like, yeah, I don't think it went well. I'm like, good Lord, the world does not need more of me. <laughs> that's not your style, man. You know, yeah. Yeah. you're not going <laughs> to, you're not going to use that one. That's not going to work for you. So I'm giving you many examples of how I bring my personality in. You know? Yeah. You have your That's own it. history, yeah, your exactly. own strengths, exactly. your own stories. As you know, I, I sat in on your great workshop of the, the storytelling. Mm-hmm. And I love how you just like, look, everybody's got stories. Yeah. You think you don't have great stories, but you know, yesterday I can pull out a, a few great stories. Right, from exactly. You, you know, and oh, yeah, and I really uh, so so I think that's the key too. Beautiful. Well, listen, I I know we've been talking for quite some time. I don't want to keep you too much longer. I appreciate your spending this time with us and giving us so much really fantastic, wonderful information. Oh, good. Just just I'm, great. I'm glad it was useful, and you know, I miss I miss chatting with you. So we should schedule a chat. You should just do that for fun. Yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. Yeah, it was it was always a, always a pleasure to to be there on the same day. I was there pretty much every day, but on the days that you would come in and well and i i feel kind of bad because by the time you came into the center honestly i was a little derelict at that point i i that was like heavy duty traveling and spending the whole winter in mexico and you know i used to be there all the time Mm. and then you know so but i loved being there when you were there that it, it really the last couple of years it was great yeah, was you know, cool. I would just be, it was like all the thoughts that I would just be thinking, I would now say out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I would like, how many times did I just like meander over to your office and be like, you know what I was thinking? <laughs> no, it was interesting. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, you're actually writing or something. You're busy. <laughs> and you always took the time to just humor me. Oh, yeah. so that was no, it, was, it was much more than just humoring you, believe me. Um, and the times that I'd come over to your office and would I'd sit down for five minutes and be there for half an hour. It was just always, always a pleasure. So, Melissa Tears, how will people find you if they want to find you? So, um, I, I do have my new website that, that I'm working on uh, constantly now, uh, Center for Integrative Hypnosis. And um, I, I still have MelissaTears.com. Yeah. yeah, dot com. <laughs> Center for Integrative Hypnosis dot com and yeah Mel- and Melissa Tears dot com is uh, you know my old uh, website that is the only website I know how to edit so I've never let it go right I've had it for I don't even know eighteen years or whatever and now that that segues into the Kajabi site by making it the kind of like about me or whatever maybe yeah, yeah. site but right. those are the two sites um, I don't even have my phone anymore. Because Verizon messed up and was supposed to switch over my number and somehow didn't. 
Hmm. And now apparently it belongs to a corporation. Uh So I'm like, oh, well, I no longer have the number I've had for 20 years. So I just recently took it off the website. (laughs) You can't even call me right now, but you can email me at mmtears at (laughs) gmail.com. And how do you spell tears just for people? Just what's T-I-E-R-S. Thank you. So and if you want my books, they're up on Amazon. I don't, uh, I don't go to the post office, so <laughs> I don't sell my books directly. <laughs> New York City post office, you know, Doug. Oh, you I, don't I, want to be messing with that. <laughs> my stuff is downloadable now, so you want it? <laughs> Here's the See, That's the way to do it. That's the <laughs> yeah. way to do it. Exactly. But, but that's how. You know, yeah, beautiful. I have a, uh, I have a uh, two intensives coming up in January, the beginning of January. Both my coaching, the unconscious mind, uh, right. course, as well as my integrative hypnosis course. January, Sweet. I think it's, um, I want to say the ninth, nice. and um, you know that's the next thing coming up, and and the membership site. So if you go to Center for Integrative Hypnosis, sign up for the newsletter, and and the student hub is gonna going to be and then then i'll have you as a as a guest hanging out all right all right my friend all right great to see you nice talking to you well that's our show for today thank you so much for joining me if you want any more information about today's show please visit our website at www.essentialcoachingskills.com be sure to tune in again next week for our next episode and discover even more about the systems and the secrets that set the best apart.